David penned those words over 3,000 years ago in Psalm 51, and while I was listening to that, I was thinking how real this is. I'm saying the same thing. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord. Turn back to Ephesians chapter 1, and tonight we're going to observe the Lord's table together. Ephesians chapter 1. I've entitled this message, What Friends Do. What Friends Do. Verse 9, having made known unto us. That's what friends do. Abraham was called the friend of God on three different occasions. Now, what could be more glorious than having the living God deem you his friend. I don't know of anything more glorious than that. For God, the living God, the creator of the universe, to deem me his friend. Now what do friends do? They make themselves known one to another. If somebody's your friend, you can bear your heart to them. You can let them know what's most important to you. That's what friends do. They make themselves known. They're open to one another. They don't have to guard their words around one another. They don't have to worry about what's being said being used against them. They know that they can say something wrong and their friends love them anyway. That's what friends do. They make themselves known to one another and they love one another. What a blessing it is to have a friend. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 18 for just a moment. Verse 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? You see, you don't do that with friends, do you? And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I shall do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that thing which he hath spoken of him. Now that's obviously not talking about national Israel. That's talking about the spiritual seed, the elect, all of God's people who will follow the faith of Abraham. But the Lord was not going to hide that from Abraham, because Abraham was his friend. Psalm 25, 14 says, The secret of the Lord, the intimate counsel of the Lord, those which he discloses himself to. That's what the word means. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear now, this fear of the Lord makes them afraid to look anywhere but Christ alone. That's what the fear of God is, faith in Christ. Somebody that doesn't look to Christ alone has no fear of the living God. But the secret of the Lord, the intimate counsel of the Lord is with them that fear him. To them, he'll show his covenant. Turn with me to John chapter 15. Verse 15. Henceforth, John 15, verse 15. Henceforth, I call you not servants. 
For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. Now, if somebody is your servant and you feel no need to explain what you're doing, just do it. Do it. I don't have to give you a reason. You're going to do it because you're my servant. But I, uh, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I've called you friends, and this is to every believer, for all things that I've heard of my Father, I've made known unto you. That which is most important to me, the things which I've heard of my Father, all things I have made known unto you. Now with all that in mind, let's think about this amazing statement Paul makes in verse 9 of Ephesians chapter 1. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Revelation. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Now the only way we can know him is if he is pleased to make himself known to us. Isn't that an amazing thought that the Lord has made himself known to you? I don't know of anything more amazing than that. That the Lord, God of glory, has made himself known, has disclosed himself, has revealed to any man, me, I'm amazed, that which is most precious to himself. That's what friends do. They make themselves known. When the Lord said to his disciples, whom say men that I am? And they started saying, well, good things. Some say you're John the Baptist or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Whom say ye that I am? Thou art the Christ, replied Peter, the son of the living God. The Lord said, blessed art thou. Simon Bar-Jonah. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to me. But my Father, which is in heaven. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hid these things. You've done this. You've hid these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them. Revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Paul said, when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal, to reveal, to make known his son in me. Now, you will only make yourself known to people that you can trust. Isn't that so? You're not going to make known the thoughts of your heart to somebody that you can't trust. Somebody that could use that information in a wrong way. You only make yourself known to people you can trust and confide in. And that's what the Lord has done with every one of his people. He's made them people he can entrust that which is most precious to himself and make it known to them. He's caused them to be faithful. He's caused them to believe and to receive what he says. Now what A privilege, I repeat, what a privilege for him to make you or me his friend. The friend of God. Where he can confide in me and entrust that which is most precious to himself to me. Now that's what this thing of revelation is. He gives you a new heart to receive it and he makes himself known. Now, why is it that you believe and somebody else doesn't? Because he's not made himself known to them the way he has to you. They're not part of that us. When he says, having made himself known unto us, the us of Romans 8, 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? But what a blessed, blessed privilege to have God 
make himself known to you. And if he has made himself known, your heart cry is, oh, to grace. How great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Now notice in our text, having made known unto us the mystery. The mystery of his will. Now a mystery is that which could never have been known had not God made it known. The word is not like a murder mystery, who done it? <laughs> Agatha Christie or the Hardy Boys or any of those you know, mysteries you're trying to figure out, who done it? No, it's not like that at all. A mystery in the scripture is a transcendent, glorious truth that is beyond intellectual comprehension. You could never say regarding the mysteries of the scripture, I got them down. I understand them. The mystery of the Trinity. One God in three distinct persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Somebody says, I comprehend that. No, you don't. You believe it. You believe it, but you don't comprehend it. What about the mystery of the believer's eternal union with the Lord Jesus Christ? How I've always been united to Him. And God has never looked at me independently of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mystery. I don't understand it, but I believe it. The mystery of eternity. God does not dwell in time. He's not bound by space or time the way you and I are. He's not bound to see what's going to happen at a sequence of events. All things are in the eternal now to him. Do I understand that? Not even vaguely, but I believe it. If somebody says they understand these mysteries, all they prove is what a big fool they are for even saying something like that. These are mysteries that we believe. And while we are painfully aware that we don't understand these mysteries, we believe them. And we know them. I love what the Lord said to his disciples. It's given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. But to them, it is not given. Now, if it's given to you, he gave something to you that he didn't give to everybody else. What are you going to say? Well, how could that be fair? Or amazing grace. Why would he do that for me? When we preach the gospel, we set forth the mysteries of God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 7, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom. Who hid it? God did. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, let a man so account of us as stewards of the mysteries of God. He said in Ephesians 6, 19, pray for me that utterance might be given me that I might open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Look at Ephesians chapter 3 for a moment. Verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. He was writing from a Roman prison. And he didn't say the prisoner of Rome, but a prisoner of Jesus Christ. For you Gentiles, if you've heard of the dispensation of the stewardship of the grace of God, which is given me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. He made known this mystery to me, and I'm making it known to you. And if you are made to see this mystery, 
God's made it known to you just as much as he did to Paul. Mystery. Having made known to us the mystery of his will. Now turn into, I think it's interesting, the word mystery is used in the book of Ephesians more than any other book in the Bible. But look at this mystery he speaks of in verse 32 of chapter 5. Now, Paul had been giving instructions on marriage. And look what he says in verse 32. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now, he'd been speaking of marriage. Look in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself forth that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. No man ever yet hated his own flesh but nourishes it and cherishes it even as the Lord the church for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Now this is a great mystery, but here's what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about marriage, I'm talking about Christ and the church. Both he that sanctifieth, Hebrews 2.11, Mitch just read it. Both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. Now this is the truth concerning Christ and the church. Eternally united. How close is this union? Well, the Lord gives us the closest illustration and I don't even know that it's, well, yes, it's a great illustration because the Lord gave it. I don't know whether it's possible to, to give the reality of this, but he gave the illustration of the vine and the branches. I'm the vine, you are the branches. The same stem that runs through the vine runs through the branches. And there's no connecting point. No connecting point. How real is this union? Well, how really did he truly take my sin and make it his own? My sin became his sin so that he became guilty of that sin. And that's why the Lord killed him on Calvary's tree. That's how real this union is. How real is this union? I am made the very righteousness of of God in him. How real is this union? Do I understand this? How I've always been in Christ? No, not at all. Do I believe it with all my heart and with all my soul? And there's no truth of the scripture that's understood apart from this thing of union with Christ. Why did God choose me? Because I was in Christ. Why did God love me? Because I was in Christ. Why does God save me? Because I'm in Christ. Why does God preserve me? Because I'm united to his son. That's why. Oh, what a glorious mystery. Union with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when we're baptized, all we're talking about is union with Christ. When he lived, I lived. When he died, I died. When he was raised, I was raised. How close is this union? 1 John 4, 17 says, As he is, so are we in this world. Now this is how close this union is. However holy he is, however pleasing to God he is, however beautiful he is to his Father, that is everyone who's united to him. Turn to Colossians 1. Look at 
Verse 26. Even the mystery. There's that word. Something we would never have known had not God made it known. And something that we really can't intellectually grasp. We can only believe. Even the mystery which hath been hid from the ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Now, the mystery of union is Christ, with Christ is you in Christ. And here we read of the mystery of Christ in you. The hope of glory. In John chapter 17, verse 23, the Lord said, I in them and thou in me, that they be made perfect in one in us. Paul said in Galatians, 6, or Galatians 2, 20, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, how mysterious. I know this. If I believe, it's because he's in me. If I live before God, it's because he's in me. If I exercise true repentance, it ain't me. It's him in me. I don't ascribe anything to myself. It's him in me. Look in 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is talking about deacons, but look what it describes concerning them. And it's true with regard to every believer. Holding. Holding with a tight grip. Holding so you won't let it go by the grace of God. You realize it's only by the grace of God you're doing this holding. Oh, you don't have any question about that. I don't have to convince anybody of that. Holding the mystery of the faith. In a pure conscience. That's talking about the pure heart that God has given. The new man. The new man in Christ Jesus. That's who holds the mystery of the faith. Look in Titus chapter 1. We get some idea of what that mystery is. Verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ. According to the faith of God's elect. The acknowledging, the full recognition and embracing of the truth, which is after godliness. Now, the mystery of the faith that we hold on to, look for the mystery of the fall. I was condemned in somebody else. The mystery of the cross. I'm saved in somebody else. Oh, the mysteries of the gospel that we hold on to. We don't want to let them go because we find our only hope in the mysteries of the gospel. Condemned in somebody else, saved in somebody else, God making a way to be just and justify the ungodly. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 16. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now great is this mystery. How infinitely great. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ, the second person of the blessed Trinity, about 2,000 years ago, actually became flesh, became a man. What mystery. And he was justified in the spirit. 
He completed the great work of the justification of his people and God the Holy Spirit testified to it. Justified in the Spirit. Scene of angels. I love to think of angels watching him. You know, there's a lot of things they're probably not much interested in going around this planet, but here's something they were interested in. Can you imagine how astonished they were when they saw him in Mary's womb? What is he doing? I, I love to think of them just watching his childhood in, in amazement at his perfections and, and thinking of his public ministry when he's being mistreated. And I bet they're, they're, what's holding us back from smiting these people who are mistreating him? How amazed were they when they beheld him on the cross? Oh, he was seen of angels. You can be sure that they watched every second of his life. He was preached unto the Gentiles. You know, it's a mystery that you and I are hearing the gospel right now. That's a great mystery. That you and I can hear and believe and rejoice in the gospel. You know, you're getting right now what many people have never heard. The hearing, the preaching of the gospel. And then he says, believed on in the world. This is a great mystery that I believe. I really do. What I'm preaching to you, I believe. You're hearing something you believe, and that's a great mystery of God that you believe and received up into glory, <laughs> having finished the work God gave him to do. Turn to Revelation 1. Verse 20. Now, there was seven candlesticks and seven stars. And he tells us what this is. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand. And the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The, that's, that's actually talking about the pastor, the messenger. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now what a mystery this is. The church. Where Christ walks. And the pastors through whom he speaks to his church. That's a mystery, isn't it? That's a mystery. Look in Revelation 17. Verse 5. Well, let's uh, begin reading in verse 30. Th ver verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Do you see religion as a great harlot? Do you see all these man-made denominations as children of the harlot? You see what very few people see. He's made this mystery known to you. And you see religion for what it is. The child of the great harlot of Babylon. And then in our text, and this is what I'm going to spend the last few moments on having made known unto us the mystery of His will. Having made known, having revealed, that's what friends do. Having made known the mystery of His will. Now, in some senses, knowing God's will is sovereign is logical. 
It's logical. It's the only thing that makes sense. To think of a God who is not sovereign is illogical. It, it doesn't even make sense. Uh, God is all-powerful. He had to be all-powerful to create the universe. Nature can see that. Nature can see that. You don't have to have a revelation from God to understand that God is all-powerful. And if he's all-powerful, it's only logical to think that his will is always done. I never will forget reading uh, Stephen Hawking on A Brief History of Time. He's a heathen, but he said this. He said, if there is a God, I hate to tell you this, but there's no such thing as free will. Uh, if there is a God, his will is always done. And you know, the leper understood this. When he came up to the Lord, he knew who he was. How do you know? He revealed himself to him. If you know who the Lord Jesus Christ is, it's because he's revealed himself to you. He knew the sovereignty of his will when he said, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. But then he knew the mystery of his will when Christ said, I will be thou clean. Now here's the mystery of his will. You know, multiplied millions read the same Bible you read, and they've never seen this. They've read over it and just gone on to the next verse. The Lord said, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone that seeth the Son, you see him as all. You see he's God. You see him as all in your salvation. You won't look anywhere else. And believeth on him hath everlasting life. And I'll raise him up at the last day. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, By the which will we are sanctified. Every believer. By God's will. He willed it. We are sanctified. Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Once for all. He's made known to us. The mystery. Of his will. And why did he do this? We'll turn back to our text in Ephesians chapter 1. Have you ever in your heart thought, why me? Why me? Why would he make known to me? When you were reading Mitch in Ephesians chapter 2, when the psalmist says, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Now, the natural man doesn't think that, does he? Uh, we ought to be mindful of man. God ought to do this. God ought to do that. But someone that knows who God is and who they are, they say, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Why me? Why would he make himself known to me? Pass others by that are better than me and make himself known to me. Why? Well, here's the answer. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. That's why. It was his good pleasure to do it. Which he hath purposed in himself. Himself is why he does all he does. And here's the big picture. That in the dispensation, the stewardship, the administration of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one. Now, the picture is Things are fragmented now. There's separation. Your sins have separated you. There's all kinds of separations. And you know when the when the Lord comes where it says there'll be no more sea, that means no more separation. How many, how many times have you looked out on the ocean and thought, what's on the other side? And you 
What are they doing over there? There's a great separation. But at the end times, he's going to be gathering together in one all things in Christ. And things are going to be set perfect once again. There'll be no more sin. There'll be no more opposition to Christ. All who are gathered together, they're one in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to John 17. Verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Now note that. He doesn't say the ones I hope will end up believing on me. No, they shall believe. Christ is representing them. They shall believe. No doubt about this. That they all may be one. This is what Paul was talking about. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, as thou hast loved me. Now, one other scripture. I told you Ephesians 1 was the last one, but changed my mind. John chapter 5. Verse 20. For as the Father loveth the Son and showeth him all things that himself doeth. Now that's what you think of the friendship between the Father and the Son. And the Father shows the Son everything. Everything. That's what friends do. And He will show Him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickens them and gives them life, even so the Son quickens, gives life to whom He will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which has sent me. Now, here's the Father's will. Everybody's going to honor my Son. And they're going to give Him equal honor as they do to me. Now, that's what's in God's heart. What's that do for you? What's that do for you? That God's going to honor His Son and that all men are to honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Now, listen to me real carefully. This God is going to meet you on the ground that you come to Him. If you come on the ground... Of your own works, he'll meet you there. He'll meet you there. And he'll give you exactly what you deserve. Or you come on the ground of the Son getting all the honor in your salvation, and none goes to you, it all goes to him. He'll meet you there. He'll meet you on the ground that you come. Now right now, by His grace, I'm coming on the ground of the Son, having all the honor. And that's the Father's ultimate will. And if He's made that known to you, you are his friend. Let's pray.
Lord, how we're amazed that you have been pleased to make known to us the mystery of your will in the glory of your Son and that you would count us, thy friends. Lord, we can only give thanks being amazed at thy grace. Lord, we thank you for the revelation of thy Son. And we ask that we might be shut up to him only. In his name we pray.